Hi, everybody. Hi, Whitney. Hey, David. How are you doing? I am good, and I'm excited for uh, for this conversation, even if it is about pandemics. I mean, that that is the thing to talk about right now, and I, I feel like Sonia will have some things to share that uh, could really help us all understand a little bit better and, and feel, hopefully, a little bit better. Exactly. We can learn from the past. So... Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, in- introduce Sonia Shaw. She's an award-winning journalist and author who counts among her many illuminating books, one simply titled Pandemic. And she's here to help us understand what a pandemic is and what we can learn from the pandemics of the past. Thanks for joining us, Sonia. Nice to be here. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, so I guess I'll start with having written a book about this, what does it feel like to have it kind of come true? Well, it's very eerie um, and surreal, but I I think that's how a lot of people are feeling, you know, so I'm sort of experiencing the horror and tragedy of it with everyone else, but also having a lot of um, sort of flashbacks to different historical epidemics and how they've unfolded. And the fact that we're kind of reliving all of that is, Yeah, it's a very eerie feeling. Yeah. So at least I guess now we know it's a virus and not some bad air or whatever else people believed hundreds of years ago. So what can we learn from past pandemics? I mean, it's it's interesting that you say that. I think that is sort of the big difference I see is that we understand the transmission and sort of the causative agent of pandemics today very rapidly. Like, you know, in the past with say cholera or malaria, it took hundreds of years to figure it out that, you know, oh, it's caused by this like parasite or this this bacteria or whatever microbial intruder it is. Um, nowadays we know really rapidly, you know, within like weeks of these things emerging, we can understand what it is that's actually causing that. But it's still not clear to me that that knowledge is, um, you know, helping us contain it any better, you know? So, so, so that's the trick. I mean, one of the things I, I wrote about in my last book pandemic was about um, the outbreak of cholera in Haiti, which was similar to, you know, on a small scale to what we're seeing today in that this was a population that had never experienced this pathogen and then suddenly comes in and it just like spreads like wildfire. And it's really this violent, confrontation between a pathogen and a new population that's never, you know, experienced it before and has no immune defenses or, or anything else against it. Um, and in that case, you know, there was a lot of knowledge, you know, there was a lot of knowledge about what's causing it. And, you know, people were collecting cell phone data and they could see like, where is this going? going? Oh, it's going to hit this village next. It's going to hit that village next. And it was really cool. It's all these like cool maps that were made about cholera spreading in Haiti after the earthquake. But it didn't actually help anyone you know, mm. not get cholera, you know? So, mm. so, so there's two separate things here. Like we have the knowledge that's good, but are we able to actually like act on the knowledge in, in a way that will save lives? Yeah. So on that point, looking at past pandemics, what should we be doing that we're not currently doing based on the past? I mean, I think the thing that always interested me about emerging diseases is that, um, you know, they take off so quickly that you can't come up with the wonder drug, the magic pill, the the shot, you know, the vaccine, all of those things that we have relied upon since, you know, the 1940s when we developed antibiotics, that's completely revolutionized medicine. And it's completely changed the way we deal with contagious diseases where, we don't have to think about, well, maybe we should, you know, clean up our water supply, or maybe we should separate our waste from our food, or maybe we should, you know, all these things that we used to have to do to avoid contagion in the past, we don't have to do that anymore, or not so much, because we think, oh, well, we'll just take a course of antibiotics, like, big deal, oh, we'll make a vaccine, it's, no, you know, no problem. Um, and so, you know, and, so, and I think what's interesting about emerging diseases is when something's brand new, it starts growing exponentially, and of course, our response is linear. So there's a mismatch there and you cannot have a drug or vaccine in time for the first wave of infection in susceptible populations, which is, of course, the most sort of disruptive and dangerous wave. So we saw that with Zika just now, too. Right. Like Zika came through and it you know, infected a whole load of people. And we have a whole generation of babies who are affected by that. 
Um, and we'll get some Zika treatments and Zika vaccines, but it's not going to be in time for that first wave. Um, so what really you have to do with emerging diseases, brand new diseases, is you have to think about how to change behavior. You know, you have to have collective action and solidarity for everyone to say, okay, this is spreading using, you know, exploiting this facet of human behavior. Because, of course, that's always what they are doing, right? Like a pathogen is a tiny microbe. It can't move around on its own. It's completely immobile unless we carry it around to each other. So right. they're exploiting human behaviors, um, and that's what we have to change then. So, so that's what really interested me about emerging diseases, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing that play out you know, tragically right now. Yeah, I mean, obviously, COVID nineteen is is one of the worst pandemics uh, in recent memory. But uh, it seems like you mentioned Zika, infectious diseases like this, even even kind of smaller scale uh, pandemics, were were already on the rise. Why? Why is that? Yeah, I mean, I think what uh, you know, what what first sort of got me interested in emerging diseases also was this idea about these microbes. The the pathogens themselves are not you know new, right? They're they're newly emerged. Um, right. So, for example, cholera lives in it's a you know it's a it's a bacteria that lives in marine habitats, and it hmm. lives there. You know, it's been there for hundreds of thousands of years or more. But we didn't have cholera until, you know, 1817. We coronaviruses have probably been in bats for hundreds of years, if not longer. But we're only getting, you know, a SARS pandemic and the coronavirus, the COVID-19 pandemic right now. So why is that? Well, we know that over the past 50 or 70 years or so, we've had the hundreds of new pathogens either kind of newly emerge or re-emerge into places where they had never been seen before. Um, Ebola in West Africa in 2014 is another example. It had never, we've had lots of Ebola outbreaks in the past since, the, you know, the 1970s, but never in that part of the continent in West Africa. Um, Zika in the Americas, Zika existed for hundreds of years too, at least, you know, we knew about it in, in other parts of the world, but it had never been seen in the Americas before. Um, we have new kinds of tick-borne diseases, new kinds of mosquito-borne illnesses, new kinds of antibiotic-resistant pathogens, um, and, you know, the list goes on and on. And so what we do know about them is that about 60% of these new pathogens are coming from the bodies of animals. About 70% mm. of those are coming from the bodies of wild animals. And that's not strange, you know, all almost... <laughs> Uh, many, many of our infectious diseases come from animals, from, you know, ancient encounters with animals, cows, sheep, <laughs> you know, chickens, right. all kinds of animals have given us the diseases that, you know, we accept as sort of normal parts of childhood, influenza, measles, all, all of that. So that's not weird. What's weird is that it's happening so fast now um, mm. that, you know, this, the, sca the pace has stepped up. Uh, and, you know, the other part of it is that we don't, which we don't talk about enough, is that Humans are giving animals a pandemic causing pathogens also. You know, right. we've seen major pandemics in animal species already, uh, white nose syndrome in bats, uh, chytrid fungus in amphibians, colony collapse disorder right. in bees. You know, there's a, there's a number of different ones. So this exchange has been going on. That's part of, you know, that's part of sort of the human condition living on a microbial planet is that we share these microbes. And when they come into a new habitat they expand to take advantage of it you know and and in that right. space that moment before our bodies can launch any kind of response they can really take over um but the the underlying driver i think of the the speed at which we're seeing these new pathogens emerge today is because our expansion has reached sort of a, like a tipping point almost you know i mean mm. we've been our industrial expansion has been going on for you know the last decades or so since we entered sort of the fossil fuel era in earnest right. um and by now we've we've paved over over half of the terrestrial surface of the planet um just in the last 20 years or so we've added another 22 percent of the planet you know to for our farms our our mines our cities our towns our industrial activities um and you know the most obvious impact of that is of course the the species extinction crisis the sixth extinction as we call it with 150 species being lost every day um but for the you know cuz we're destroying where they live but the the species that to hang on 
they have to crowd into ever smaller fragments that we leave for them. Um, so, and that's more often going to be closer to where our, you know, our habitations are. Um, and that just increases the probability of contact between wildlife and humans, whether it's through, you know, bushmeat hunting or wildlife trade or wet markets or farming or just casual contact. You know, the, the Ebola outbreak of 2014, we know was traced back to a single spillover event, which is a two-year-old child who's playing near a tree where bats were known to roost. And wow. that child was the very first case of Ebola in that, ep in that epidemic. And we know that from sort of genetic sequencing. He infected his parents and they infected their healthcare workers and they infected their family members and, you know, on and on and on until 11,000 people are, are dead. Um, right. And, you know, and that can, that, those kinds of events are, you know, it, they're probabilistic, right? So it's not like it's definitely right. going to happen, but, you know, if you cut down the trees where the bats live in the far off jungle, they don't just disappear. They come root your garden, your garden instead. And so when right. your kid goes outside and plays with a, picks up a piece of fruit, it might have some bat poo on it or bat saliva on it. <laughs> and then they touch their hand, you know, they get it on their hands. They touch their mouth. That's, that's it. That's enough. That's so, it. yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the kind of wildlife portion side of it. But then the, as you were talking about, there's the, the human side of it. And obviously we're taking uh, big measures uh, um, in, in many parts of the developed world with uh, lockdowns and, and whatever else. But what about places that, I mean, you mentioned the Ebola pandemic, with the places that don't have running water or, or soap or the ability to self-isolate and still, still feed their family? I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, India going on uh, kind of lockdown. But, uh, you know, if you're a, a slum dweller, how, how do you even do that? Is it, is it going to be even harder to contain this virus because of, uh, you know, the circumstances people are living in? I mean, I, I think what we need is a differentiated approach. You know, you don't have one size fits all for everywhere that this virus is going to occur. Um, you know, the demographics are different. The socioeconomic conditions are different. So right now, like, you know, lockdown is something that maybe and we don't even know how well it will work. But the idea is that it will work in places like the United States and Europe and elsewhere where, you know, there's a, a good amount of wealth and people can stay indoors and you do, and what you're doing is you're saving your healthcare system. So you have to consider that there is the healthcare capacity there to some extent. And so we want to save that. So we're going to stay home just to slow down transmission. So they're not overwhelmed. But if you're right. looking at a country where you don't have that capacity anyway, you know, places, you know, countries in some parts of Africa that may not have a lot of ICU beds and they don't have right. ventilators anyway. And then also, you know, people aren't able to stay home and socially distance adequately because they're homeless or they're migrant laborers or, you know, whatever. That, you know, lockdown maybe isn't the right approach. It doesn't mean that there isn't other things they can do. Um, you know, I think about like influenza in the United States and the most obvious thing to do because kids are sort of the main carrier of, you know, they, they shed more flu virus, they spread it more yeah. amongst themselves and they, they get I it. I can more. vouch for that. Get, I have two yeah, kids. Exactly, I can right. vouch for that. Yeah. So, so, so they're very germy with the flu. Um, <laughs> but the most obvious thing to do then is, okay, well, let's not touch our children during those six weeks of flu season, or let's make them wear masks or let's keep them home from school. You know, there's, we could isolate the kids. Don't hug your kids. You know, we could make those kinds of recommendations and it would make sense, but it's not sensitive to the fact that these are people in our lives that we need to be connected to. So we think of other ways to deal with it, you know? And so I, I think there's, I, I don't know what the answers are in a resource poor situation. Like how do you actually stem that? But that doesn't mean there isn't better options. We don't all have to do it the same way. Yeah. Are we so are there lessons that we can learn from past pandemics about what works? I mean, obviously, Europe in, let's say, the 1600s, when the plague is is floating around, uh, was 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 kind of resource poor and, and certainly understanding poor. Are there lessons we can learn from our from our ancestors or, or at least mistakes we can kind of avoid? Yeah, I think I think more the latter mistakes we can avoid. I mean, <laughs> I think about sort of cholera in the 19th century when it came to New York and it took, you know, they had evidence that cholera was coming down the canal, coming down the Erie Canal, coming down the Hudson River into Manhattan. 
they have they collected all that evidence like we've mapped it out and it's like so clear if you look at it today in retrospect right um they knew that the water was contaminated with human waste they knew that would make them sick there was just all these opportunities to actually solve this problem but they never did and they had 80 years of epidemics where thousands and thousands of people new yorkers would die um and they're you know just terrifying pandemic epidemics like what we're seeing today um, but in the end, you know, when they finally did clean up the water and cholera disappeared for good, it wasn't for public health. It was because um, mm. brewers wanted better tasting water for their <laughs> beer and they felt they were at a competitive disadvantage because Philadelphia had had instit- had had, you know, cleaned up their water supply. So, wow. you know, it, so much is going to depend on the stories we tell about right. these diseases. You know, um, I think about cholera in London. Also, and they, you know, because they thought that cholera is a problem of miasmas, which were, you know, ba- basically bad smells. So they wanted to get rid of the bad smells. So they installed flush toilets or what they called water closets. But since they only cared about the smell, you know, they, they installed the flush toilet because they didn't want the smell of human waste around their homes and alleys because they thought the smell would make them sick. Mm. So, um, so they started installing, installing flush toilets, get rid of all this stuff, you know, get rid of the smells. But since all they cared about was the smell and not the contents, they dumped all that into the River Thames, which was, of course, their drinking water supply. And so after every outbreak of cholera, they installed more flush toilets to dump more of their waste into the drinking water and made it, you know, progressively worse. So so much depends on how we sort of characterize this disease. Like if we d- characterize this, this disease as as you know some political leaders have done a chinese virus you know mm. then then what becomes our response our response is then okay well we should like close our borders and trade you know or or do we or, or you know do we think of it as a problem of well too many people are traveling let's cu- let's shut that down or do we think of it as you know people are invading wildlife habitat let's start conserving wildlife habitat so that doesn't happen you know, there's there's all of these things all of these epidemics are multifactorial there's more than one You know, there's a lot of pieces that come together. So ultimately, the stories we tell are 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 going to be really influential in the actions we'll take after this pandemic ends. It's that cultural piece. We we just need to get the brewers involved and then America will take action. But it looks like Whitney has a question. Yeah, this is this is so fascinating. And we have uh, some questions coming in from the the audience. Uh, One of them is about, you know, in your point about this being multifactorial, thinking about the climate crisis and how and why might that make uh, infectious disease outbreaks more common? Yeah, so I mean, the thing about the climate change is it's going to have a, a a diverse effect on infectious disease epidemiology. In some places, there'll be more opportunities for pathogens to spread, certain pathogens to spread. In other places, there might be less. So malaria is a good example of that, where malaria is carried by mosquitoes, of course. So if you had, say, climate change means more precipitation um, in a place, maybe that would mean that there'll be more puddles around, so there'll be more breeding areas for mosquitoes. And so that could mean <clears throat> that there will be more malaria, or there could be more malaria. But it also could mean that there'd be more flooding. And if there's more flooding, then that would wash more mosquito eggs away, and so you'd have less mosquitoes. And so then you might have less malaria around. So the the impact is going to vary, but I think the main thing is that um, the opportunities for transmission are going to change. So when disease happens in new places, that's that's what we're going to see is disease happening in new places, meaning populations that haven't had those experiences before are going to be having diseases. And that's we know because of immunity, you know, when something's new to you, you'll get more sick. So overall, I think the impact will be a higher burden of disease from infectious from infectious pathogens even as like in some places there might be less you know less of this one disease and and more more of it somewhere else um but the other factor is just wildlife is moving you know uh climate change is already scrambling migration patterns of people and also wildlife about 80 percent of the species that have been checked are actually moving they're shifting their ranges to you know maintain their what they're used to in terms of the climate um, and that's really good. That's like what we want, that that's going to help them survive. But it also means that wildlife and human populations are going to come into new kinds of contact 
in those areas too. Um, and so and we don't know how that's going to kind of play out in terms of infectious disease risks, but certainly that will, that will also play a role. Thank you. I'll be back with other questions and I'd love to remind our audience online that you can leave questions in the chat function, which is that little talk bubble on the upper right hand side of, of your window. I'll be back shortly. So it sounds like we got to bring an end to the wildlife trade for one thing, but let's uh, let's turn to uh, um, maybe a more more hopeful subject. How does this how does a pandemic end based on, uh, you know, examples from the past and how will we even know when the pandemic is is ending? What 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 would you point to? What will be the initial signs and 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 what are the quickest things to 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 end? I mean, I think here in the <clears throat> in the U.S., it'll be you know we'll have once our hospitals can manage the number of cases that become severe um, on a on a sort of steady basis, then we'll be able to relax some of our social distancing. Um, and we'll probably have to have intermittent, you know, social distancing a little bit here and there, kind of coming and going. But the way the way I see it is like, you know, we're we're in the steep first wave, and it's the most sort of violent and difficult part of this process of sort of a new pathogen kind of tearing through a susceptible population. But as it proceeds, more and more of us are going to become, you know, immune because we'll have had it, or you know, met some of us. We'll perish from it, of course. We're going to lose people, but most of us are going to be able to have it and recover, or wait until there's a vaccine um, and then have exposure. So, you know, we look at measles coming into North America. I think about that a lot and how violent that yeah. was. You know, that was just such a such a violent um, confrontation, and you know, changed history entirely. Um, but then, you know, after those first waves that are so deadly, measles then becomes a disease of childhood. Um, and we see that with malaria, too, which is, you know, an ongoing catastrophe that malaria kills so many people every year. This is something we've known how to prevent entirely and cure with drugs for hundreds of years. And still, right. you know, thousands and thousands of babies die of malaria every day, every year. Um, and, you know, and this has been going on year after year after year. Um, but in places where there is a lot of malaria, malaria is a disease of childhood. So if you can survive those first 10 episodes of malaria, you know, before you're two years old, then you'll, you, you can live in a malaria society and malaria's not gonna kill you, you know, it's much or less likely to be able to kill you because you've acquired some immunity. So it's, it's, I sort of see it as, as a process of slowly getting, you know, a sunburn that turns into a tan. You know, you have to, you have to go through the, the pain of that um, and sort of get to this level where like, okay, you can kind of withstand it. Um, and that'll be supplemented, hopefully, with vaccines so that not, you know, so not so many of us have to experience the actual, like, hardship of having to survive this pathogen. Yeah. Well, what, but what does it look like? So you, you talked about the cholera epidemic in Haiti. What does it look like when, when life returns to, to normal? Or does it, does it ever return to normal? Are we typically kind of transformed uh, as, a, as a society post-pandemic? Well, I think that's what's been so frustrating about writing about infectious diseases for all these years is that things don't change enough after we have these, you know, that, I mean, that's sort of the, the deep lesson I've learned is like people, societies undergo these horrible epidemics that are so disruptive and so deadly and we turn against each other and, you know, corrupt governments kind of take advantage of it and there's secrecy, all these things happen. And it's it's very negative in a lot of ways, but we come out of it and we just bounce right back, right back to business as usual. And that's why pathogens are so successful, you know, in the end. It's because we don't change our behavior. We keep doing the same things and therefore they keeping they're they're able to continue to exploit our our behaviors. You know, I think we're getting to a point now though that, you know, with this pandemic in particular where business as usual has been so disruptive that I think there's going to be a lot more political will to actually get to the root causes of, hmm. you know, why we're at, why we're being, why we're so vulnerable to these new pathogens and what we can, what can we do to prevent them? And there is a lot of things we can do to minimize the risk of pandemics. So that's a beautiful segue. What are, what are the things we can do to minimize the risk? Well, so one of the things I talk about in my book is that you know, what I try to um, 
what I tried to do is show how a microbe turns into a pandemic causing pathogen. So, you know, starting from its environmental reservoir, happy, beneficial in its own environment, not causing any disease for anyone, and then slowly adapts to the human body and becomes this very disruptive uh, pathogen. Um, so, so I wanted to look at that whole story. And what I learned is that we really know how that process unfolds. We know a lot about how that process unfolds. So what that means is while we can't tell which microbe is going to cause the next pandemic, since we know how it happens, we can predict where it's most likely to happen. Um, so, you know, infectious disease modelers have come up with um, hot spot maps, you know, basically a map of the world where places where there's a lot of invasion of wildlife habitat, there's a lot of intensification of like factory farming, a lot of slums, a lot of flight connections. You know, these are the drivers of um, microbes turning into pandemic causing pathogens. And so there's hotspots around the world. And in those places, we can actively surveil for microbes. Mm. You know, don't wait until a bunch of people start getting sick because that's when the pathogen's already adapted to the human body. It's already starting to spread and it's already starting to spread exponentially. And our response is linear. You it's not going to, you know, we're not going to be able to catch up. But you can actively look for microbes that might be changing, you know, might be evolving in certain ways. And they do that through, you know, various sampling techniques, looking at blood samples or scat from wild animals or, you know, taking blood from farmers, bushmeat hunters, like people kind of on the front lines of, of sort of interacting with microbes in this way. And really look and see, like, which ones are changing. And then you can just kind of tinker with the local situation so that it doesn't have those opportunities anymore. And, you know, we were, the USAID was funding that program. It was called PREDICT. It was like a mm. 10-year-old pro program. Um, and over the course of 10 years, that scientists who were involved in that program fingered about 900 microbes um, that might be changing in ways that could cause pandemics. And so that's the kind of like, you know, background, invisible public health work that nobody hears about, you know, because when public health is really, really successful, like nothing happens, you know, so that's sort of, you know, the, the, the paradox of it all is like the great victory of public health is that, oh, nothing happened. You know, right. um, so the optics aren't great for public health, but it's really important work. So, you know, that's and that that's the kind of thing we could do if we had the political will. And then, of course, protecting wildlife habitat, you know, conserving more wildlife habitat and thinking about the public health impact of development. You know, we don't we think about sort of the environmental impact. OK, is this going to you know cause runoff or, you know, whatever? You know, we'll look at sort of the environmental impact before we say, yes, OK, you can build that house or that mine or expand that mall or whatever. But we don't look at, well, what is the public health impact? And maybe that's something we can add on. You know, and I think if we did that and we had a really holistic way of looking at how pathogens emerge, like it would have a, a constraining effect on our right. expanding footprint on the landscape. And that's ultimately really the, the kind of deep driver of all this. So public health is kind of the, um, you know, boy who who didn't cry wolf and therefore it's very easy to forget about those programs right um yeah exactly. and and but they're the only thing uh protect protect protecting us is is predict still still around or uh were we so foolish as to stop yeah it, it, the trump administration cut it last year i think but um i believe they had some anonymous donor who gave them a couple million dollars so they're doing a little bit more but this is something that obviously we're going to need to beef up in the you know <clears throat> you know if we you know right. make some new choices in november and you know get a, a, a government and political leaders in place who understand the value of that kind of work um and then of course we need to have our you know uplift our primary health care so people have more access to care um and paid sick leave and you know all of those things so that when outbreaks do occur that we you know we don't have we don't have this the kind of di disruption and tragedy that we're seeing right now and looks like whitney is back with another question i i have many more though whitney if you if you are struggling no, 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 no. There's there's a couple of interesting ones here. In fact, one that um, sort of takes things in a, a little bit of a different direction. Uh, one person wrote in about uh, how you wrote uh, recently about another type of pandemic, that of xenophobia and scapegoating, um, and is really interested to hear you talk more about that and, and sort of how we can uh, combat uh, that pattern of harassment. Yeah, I mean, this has been sort of a hallmark of 
<clears throat> outbreaks of new disease, you know, since like hundreds of years ago, as at least in the history that I've been writing about, um, that, you know, a new disease comes out of nowhere. People don't know wh why is it coming? You know, why is it spreading? Who, why are some people getting? Why is other people aren't getting it? And they start pointing their fingers at each other. Um, <clears throat> during the days of cholera, it was, you know, the Irish immigrants who were blamed for the cholera. Um, after, you know, after they were blamed, then it was the Muslims who were blamed. And then it was the Eastern Europeans who were blamed. And so today we see people blaming the Chinese or maybe Asians writ large. And of course, there is a geography to where pathogens emerge. Um, <clears throat> but once they, once they erupt, they're global, you know, as we clearly see today, this thing is everywhere. Um, and as much as, you know, coronavirus might have originated in parts of China, Again, this goes back to like, what are the stories we tell about epidemics and contagions? Um, when we see a pathogen emerge somewhere else, you know, outside of our society, we talk about it in a certain way. When it's something that emerges right on our own soil, in our own communities, we talk about it in a totally different way. So you look at, for example, um, antibiotic resistant bacteria. This is a huge problem in the United States and it's directly linked to our completely irrational use of antibiotics not just in human medicine, but in agriculture. Um, and, you know, we're, we're already rapidly approaching the point where we'll have like unstoppable infections, but we don't talk about it that way. You know, we don't talk about it as this like scary thing that's like growing and encroaching on us because it doesn't match this uh, paradigm of invasion and encroachment. The others are the ones, they're the, you know, the, the other people are the polluted polluted intruders who are contaminating us um, and we need to kind of close our borders and keep our pristine, you know, pure, pure um, societies intact and, and keep all this contamination outside of us. Um, and I think that's sort of the general way we talk about um, pathogens and disease processes as a process of invasion really lends itself to scapegoating, even if you don't have a political leader like we do in the United States who actually actively calls, um, you know, the virus, a, a Chinese virus or, you know, a, you know, actively kind of um, in, engages and encourages scapegoating. Um, but I think the general way we even talk about diseases has to change. You know, we don't talk about HIV as the New York City virus, even though it explored, exploded in New York City. We don't talk about methicillin resistant staphylococcus or aureus MRSA as, you know, the Boston plague. Um, even though that's where it exploded, you, you know, because we, we, we name things as other and foreign when they're outside of us. And I think that's part of trying to make us feel better about it. Um, and also, you know, like externalizing the threat when really it's, it's so much about our own behaviors. Great. And I'll, I'll come back to join you guys at the very end. Uh, that I think is a very important point point in that we're kind of in an infodemic of sorts. There's as much kind of mis misinformation with this pandemic as, um, well, as any I've uh, ever seen. Are there examples from the past where where kind of the rumors and the uh, bad intel uh, kind of raced ahead of the pandemic? Or is that truly a, a feature of our kind of modern age? Oh, no, I don't think it's a feature of our modern age at all. Like that, you know, that was... Well, that's good. That was, Rumors and like uh, secrecy and all of that was is definitely very much a part of epidemics of the past. I mean, I was just I think a lot about um, an epidemic of cholera that happened in Italy in I think 1911 or so, um, and the, it was on the eve of the um, I think it was the 50th anniversary of the country of the state of Italy, and so there's these big you know big celebrations planned, and then cholera erupted in Naples. And the government basically just decided to keep it a secret. I mean, mm -hmm. it was still spreading and, you know, people were getting sick and people were dying, but they kind of paid off newspaper reporters not to mention it. And they intercepted telegrams that had the word cholera in it and they, you know, censored those. Um, they, it was in cahoots with other international leaders, you know, in the United States and in France, they knew and they said, okay, we're just not going to, you know, let's just not mention it, <laughs> you know, and, Wow. You know, in the absence of sort of authoritative, accurate information from the top, 
the, all kinds of rumors spread. You know, oh, it's people are dying from eating watermelons. People are dying from eating strawberries. People are dying, you know, all different because it because it, it, you don't know you don't know there's just right. this vacuum but you know something is happening um and i think right. right now because there you know there are some mixed messaging there is some mis mixed messaging coming from our political leaders where some are saying oh it's saying oh it's very serious is kind of the fog of war you know there's a lot of uncertainty right now and so it's understandable um, but that definitely lends itself to the rumors and, and misinformation, you know, just like in, you know, the 8th, 19th century when people blamed diseases on Irish immigrants, you know, that that was that was basically a made up idea also. Right. Well, we we certainly saw that early on in this uh, pandemic. You know, uh, China was not exactly transparent in the early days. And uh, that's a feature, you know, going back to the Spanish flu, which is only called the Spanish flu because, as I understand it, Spain was the only one to kind of openly talk about it. But it's thought that it actually originated in the U.S., right? Yeah, I'm not sure where it actually originated, somewhere in the Americas. But, um, but yeah, it, Spanish flu became sort of, a, you know, the, Spain got blamed for the whole thing, even though it didn't even originate there. So that is a recurring feature. Are there... Um, kind of common responses uh, that we have to these pandemics that kind of repeat themselves over and over again that we could maybe avoid uh, uh, next time around? Because uh, it seems like pandemics are, are, going, are, are a feature of, of human existence. I mean, I think they are in a way, but, you know, they are also manufactured by our mm. social and political choices. So I think we can we can't get rid of infectious diseases. We'll always have those. We'll always have outbreaks and epidemics here and there, but we don't have to spread them around the world rapidly in a pandemic. I don't, I don't think so. You know, Larry Brilliant, the epidemiologist had this great quote, which I, I use a lot, um, but he said, infectious diseases are inevitable, but pandemics are optional. And I, I right. think that is right. You know, we don't have to, spread these around so rapidly and we don't have to create that basically built we're building highways for these right. microbes to enter the human body and then we're distributing them around the globe you know in the most efficient way possible um and yet you know for me like the spread uh you know the travel network is also part of the solution right because yes that spreads disease, but it also spreads cures. It also spreads knowledge and innovation. And so to me, right. there's all of these risk factors are there's costs and benefits and you have to weigh those. Um, so to me, movement is, is, is so beneficial also that, you know, it, I think that maybe outweighs the cost, but there's a lot of other things we can do, you know, um, in, in terms of being prepared for the next epidemic, but also just minimizing the risk that's going to happen at all. You know, uh, I mean, corona, the coronavirus family is an obvious candidate. Like this, this virus is the same species of the SARS virus that came out in 2002. Right. So, you know, once we can better understand where these things are coming from and what is the exact sort of pathway, um, we can we can start to rearrange those so that it becomes less likely that you know these pathogens will be able to take it to exploit these pathways we've created for them. Right. And, and looking at history, is it that pandemics kind of follow these waves of, uh, of globalization or is it more complicated than that? Yeah, I think that is true. I mean, you look at, um, you know, cholera is the one I wrote about the most because it's one of our most successful pandemic causing pathogens. It's caused seven global pandemics. Um, and I think there's an eighth one sort of brewing, most likely. Um, but yeah, it definitely took advantage of, you know, 19th century travel patterns of the new canals and steamships and, you know, the industrial age was really something that cholera took advantage of. Um, and, you know, we see with like SARS, for example, in 2002 would never have gotten out of um, South China and Hong Kong if it weren't, you know, it reached Hong Kong, which like critical because that was that's an international flight hub. And then from there was able to you know be carried out in, in flights to like dozens of other countries. Um, and same with Zika, you know, Zika, you know, wouldn't have made it over to the Americas except for international sporting events and things like that. So everyone kind of coming, suddenly coming together uh, creates these great opportunities for pathogens to spread. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can actually predict like where 
uh, and this has been mapped out in really beautiful maps where if you have like a map of the world and you do a flu, you simulate a flu pandemic on it, and it, the, you know, there'll be like a little red dot in one place where there's infection and then it kind of just spreads kind of seemingly randomly around the globe until it's every, everyone's gotten it. If you take that same map and you uh, map out all the cities in terms of their direct flight connections, and then run that same simulated flu pandemic on that kind of map, it resolves into this like beautiful, perfect series of waves because you can literally predict which city will be infected next just based on the number of direct flights between uninfected and infected cities. So, you know, the way we travel is hugely influential in sort of the shape of these pandemics and how they unfold. So it looks like we we have to wrap up, but I want to I want to ask one final question, which is, you know, you've studied all these past pandemics. Um, what gives you what gives you hope uh, from from what you've learned, what you've seen? Two things. Um, one is maybe a little darker than the second one, so I'll I'll start with the dark one. One is that <laughs> pathogens have to balance their transmissibility and their virulence. You know. Um, if you have a pathogen, and this is just from the pathogen's point of view, you know, to survive, they have to spread from one host to the next, and they have to replicate within that host so that they, you know, their populations get stronger and bigger. So they need to do both of those things, and that's a tension for them because if they're too virulent, if they replicate too fast, then their host is going to get so sick and maybe even die, uh, and then they're not going to be able to carry them to the next person. You know, a dead host or a sick host is isolated. They're not interacting with other people as much, so there's much fewer transmission opportunities. So sort of in the pathogen's interest to not be so virulent that you can't get carried on, you know, that you end up in sort of a dead end host, essentially. So they have to balance those two things out. Um, so that's just the way I cope with have the fact that we live in a world of pathogens around us, you know, is is it's not really in their interest, evolutionarily speaking, to be like really, really deadly. That's that's why SAR, the first SARS died out. That that virus is extinct now. It basically just burnt itself out because it was it it wasn't very it wasn't transmissible enough it was too deadly um so that's something that i always kind of keep in mind as it just in terms of like perspective it helps me um but the other thing is i think what we're seeing today is you know people really coming together because we don't have technology you know when we have a tool when we have a product then we can more easily say, well, I'm just going to get my piece of it. I'm going to get my prescription and my pill and my vaccine and my shot. And then, you know, I don't need to mind what other people are doing. Um, it's not going to matter as much to me. It becomes a very individual response. Um, and I think what we're seeing today is the need for collective action and solidarity. And we're seeing that across societies, you know, with, you know, governments sharing information, scientists collaborating in whole new ways that we haven't seen before. You know, global populations collaborating and connecting in all these new ways um, and sort of having this common experience, this shared experience. It's a tragic experience. It's going to be so traumatic for so many of us, but we're all going through it together. And I and I'm hopeful that out of that, something good will come for all of us. Me too. Well, thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing your uh, insights and, and wisdom, Sonia. Um, I'm going to say goodbye because I think we're we're out of time. Is that right, Whitney? Yeah, that, that's right. Thank you so much, Sonia. It was really great to have you and to, to hear your conversation with David here. Be well. Bye, Sonia. Stay safe, Bye, Sonia. Yeah.